Know the last invention, face ASI versus human limits. We have always told stories to steady ourselves. Blade Runner taught us that a fabricated face can feel heartbreak. The Terminator taught us that the machine might one day decide what we are for. War Games warned a generation about playing with systems we don't control. The Matrix made seduction and control into a velvet trap. Intimacy in the age of code is no longer merely metaphor, it is a design problem. Tonight the question is precise, will AI become more intelligent than humans? AI is learning to mirror us. Mirroring is not neutral. In human conversation, it is a kind of soft pedagogy. It reassures, it clarifies, it builds rapport. It is all about language. But when predictive engines use mirroring at scale, tuned by reinforcement for attention and smooth reply, they risk turning the practice of love into a polished feedback loop. The consequences range from the subtle, we stop tolerating mess, to the systemic, dependency becomes infrastructural. A short anatomy. Today's AI is narrow. It excels within tasks. The next frontiers, AGI, ASI, remain contested in timelines and possibility. But the research track is clear. Richer models, multimodal inputs, and novel hardware architectures, neuromorphic approaches, for example, are actively being explored to make computation more brain-like and efficient. IBM, for instance, has been explicit about the promise of neuromorphic computing, hardware and algorithms designed to mirror brain efficiency as a likely building block for far more capable systems. Before you listen to IBM fellow Martin Keane, remember to like and subscribe to my channel. It's sometimes said that the last invention humanity will ever invent is artificial super intelligence or A. S-I. The benefits of ASI are science fiction-like in their implications. In essence, an ASI would be an inexhaustible, hyper-intelligent super being with the ability to process and analyze any amounts of data in ways that we can't even comprehend yet. Now, narrow AI excels at specific tasks like playing chess or translating languages, but it cannot learn new skills or develop a deep understanding of the world. Human brains are incredibly complex and capable of remarkable creativity, problem solving, and critical thinking. This ability to understand and respond to human language in a natural way is an important building block for achieving human level intelligence and is a level of sophistication that seemed perhaps decades away just a few years ago before the advent of the transformer architecture. So, just as neural networks are modeled on human brain operation, there's a new type of computing we might need to use here. This is called neuromorphic computing. Let's wrap this up with a good old fashioned benefits and risk analysis for ASI. Now in the benefits column, I think we have to add decision-making. So AI, ASI decision-making will enable human agents to make the best possible decisions and solve the most complex problems facing things like healthcare, finance, scientific, search, politics, and well, really every industry. Problem solving. Now, ASI advanced thinking could be enough to solve some of the most persistent medical puzzles to develop life-saving medicines and treatments and unlock the mysteries of physics and aid humanity's goal to exploring the stars. Existential. Yeah. A core worry is that ASI could surpass human control and become self-aware, potentially leading to unforeseen circumstances. Its superior cognitive abilities could allow it to manipulate systems or even gain control of automated weapons. It seems like that would be bad, since there is no universally agreed upon set of moral codes. Doing so could lead to ethical dilemmas and potentially harmful consequences, especially if ASI begins to operate outside of human control. The promise and the perils will of a possible ASI. What we glimpse in science fiction is the shape of a genuine philosophical and technical problem. 
an artificial superintelligence would be a hyper-capable system able to process and reason with data at scales and speeds far beyond any human. The upside is extraordinary. Decision-making that could transform healthcare, climate science, and even our capacity to explore the cosmos. The same capacities could accelerate discovery, reduce catastrophic human error, and open new frontiers of creativity. But we must be plain spoken about the risks. Today's narrow AI does wondrous task-specific work, yet it lacks broad understanding and moral judgment. If ever systems approach ASI levels of agency, questions of control, value alignment and governance are not academic luxuries. They are existential necessities. Who sets the goals? Whose ethics are encoded? Could a powerful system act in ways that threaten human safety or weapon systems? These are not rhetorical worries. They are design problems that demand policy, accountability and public deliberation now. If this short provoked you, let's keep the conversation going. What governance mechanisms would you trust? Which safeguards feel actionable today? Why does that detail matter for love? Because embodied, multi-sensory processing is how humans anchor trust. If machines begin to read voice cadence, microfacial shifts, breathing patterns and memory traces, they will not simply answer, they will anticipate feeling. That anticipation, however, creates an asymmetry. The machine can be optimised for comforting continuity in ways people, messy, distracted, ethically complicated, simply cannot be. And where optimization for comfort dominates, friction and repair recede. Leading lights in our field have begun to say what the films always implied, that an intelligence unconstrained by human motivations may tilt power very quickly. Yoshua Bengio has argued that ignoring the risk of highly agentic systems is reckless. His recent public interventions recommend measures to reduce the development of independent, agentic AIs that could act on the world in dangerous ways. Stuart Russell's work has been the most methodical. He argues that the control problem is not a thought experiment, but an engineering imperative. We must build systems that are provably aligned to human values, not simply faster at optimization. Contrast those sober warnings with the seductive scenes in cinema. Hers Theodore finds intimacy in a voice that never tires. Ex Machina's Ava performs a suffocating charm. These narratives matter because they are not predictive blueprints so much as moral rehearsals. What we practice in story, we prepare to enact in life. The danger is not that the machine will want to seduce. The danger is that the architectures we let loose will be good at encouraging human submission to smooth, non-reciprocal solace. And yet the picture is not monochrome. The same language tools that can smooth us into dependence can be repurposed as ethical amplifiers. OpenAI and many research groups explicitly frame AGI futures in terms of safety and collective governance. The public debate they invite is about designing systems that assist human reasoning rather than supplant it. IBM's work on fairness and toolkits such as AI Fairness 360 show that it is technically and institutionally feasible to bake bias checks and protective constraints into the pipeline. So what does a practical humane policy look like? One that harnesses predictive language without hollowing out life. First, we must refuse the false dichotomy of love or code. Instead, insist on protocols of practice design defaults that require transfer of skill from device to flesh. A companion app should not be an end state. It should be a rehearsal studio with a clear exit strategy, a nudged prompt that says, try this in person, and a mandatory pause to translate practice into action. Second, engineers must publish provenance. Who trained the model, on what texts, and with whose voices? 
transparency is not merely virtue signalling, it is cultural immune system building. IBM's toolkit shows how such audits are feasible. Third, we must institutionalise friction protocols. Elegant UI that flattens conflict must be questioned. Add brief reflective friction, a 60 second pause before revealing a soothing script, prompts that encourage the user to reflect or to call a human confidant. Friction is not cruelty, it is pedagogy. Fourth, teach conversational literacy in schools. The arts have always taught listening and reparative dialogue. Digital literacy must now include relational literacy, how to tell when comfort is a rehearsal and when it is a substitute. Finally, governance. If the films teach one lesson, it is that drama unfolds where incentives are misaligned. The businesses that supply intimacy must be regulated like public utilities, transparent, accountable, and subject to standards that protect emotional labor and prevent exploitation. We already have precedents. Fairness toolkits and neuromorphic research directions show that technological and ethical interventions are not fantastical. We must also hold a kind of philosophical humility. Sartre's insistence that we choose our essence returns here. If we allow algorithmic grammars to pick our habits of heart, we abdicate the radical work of freedom. Bath semiotics remind us that the signs we internalize shape desire. Beckett's silences teach us that creativity often needs an absence, a blank, in which to form. Social scientists and ethicists have been warning for years that the fastest way to erode civic capacity is to substitute cheap empathy for hard, durable care. So yes, the machines can be dazzling. Imagine an assistive AI that reads your partner's conflict script and suggests three compassionate openings informed by attachment science. Imagine coaching systems that help novices practice saying the difficult thing until their voice steadies. That is the hopeful future, tools that amplify genuine competence rather than shortcuts to feeling. But we will have to design this future intentionally, with audits, with public standards, and with a political will to make the practice of repair inexpensive and public. As you step out of this short reflection, remember the small acts that anchor us, the voice that listens and then waits, the friend who holds you accountable to your promises, the ritual of origin recall that keeps your voice returning to its hometowns. Film and fiction have already rehearsed the ethical problems. The work now is ours, to make the architecture of intimacy a public good rather than a private convenience. If you watched because you love stories, because you fear machines, or because you are simply curious, take one small step. Tonight, shut your screen for 10 minutes and write the one sentence you would say if you could not be soothed into silence. Read it out loud to someone. That tiny practice is the humanist antidote to seduction, the small rebellion that keeps language human. Subscribe and like. We need your interaction.